for Port Adelaide. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm happy to rise to speak to the Water Amendment Bill 2018. Uh, I do so as a member um, for a South Australian electorate, South Australia always having had a particular interest in the health of the Murray-Darling Basin. Also, um, as a former Water Minister, albeit for a matter only of several weeks, uh, but also as a shadow Water Minister during the last term of Parliament who understood uh, I think the fragility of this plan and the importance of bipartisanship, of agreement between the two major parties to keep a plan that was so hard fought, to keep that plan back on track. Um, uh, and I'll come to the, I guess, the processes that has uh, led us to be considering this bill, Deputy Speaker. The bill is quite specific, and the bill allows for the Northern Basin Review Instrument. The Northern Basin Review being um, an element of the plan to be remade and to be tabled again in the parliament. But more broadly, this bill reflects uh, an agreement between the major parties, particularly notably the minister who is at the table today and our shadow minister, the member for Watson, essentially to get the Murray-Darling Basin plan back on track. Uh, I don't think it's <clears throat> any exaggeration to say uh, that this plan was, for a period of time, hanging by a thread. Uh, and with it uh, was hanging by a thread also the best possible chance our nation has of returning this incredibly important river system to a sustainable, healthy condition for now and the future. The scale of the achievement that's enshrined in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is difficult to overstate, Deputy Speaker. It was incredibly hard fought. Um, and follows literally decades of disagreement and conflict around the way in which the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was managed. Uh, but it, it focuses on one of the most important environmental and economic assets that this nation has. About 40 per cent of the nation's agriculture is dependent upon the health of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, uh, feeding into about $19 billion uh, of our GDP. Those figures are probably out of date. It's probably substantially more than that now. Uh, and importantly, particularly I say as a, as a resident and a representative of Adelaide, uh, it, um, uh, it delivers uh, drinking water for about 1.3 million or more Australians. So this is an incredibly important environmental, social, cultural and economic asset. And uh, the scale of achievement, as I said, in delivering or, or, or finalising and then delivering the Murray-Darling Basin Plan uh, is really difficult to overstate. Uh, the, the history of this basin, the history of this basin has been one of political conflict, uh, conflict within industry, between industry and environmental groups, and essentially one of over-extraction, one of um, extraction at levels that has seen a steady, inexorable decline in the health of this incredibly important national asset. Uh, that really is the history. Uh, the present and the future has added to that uh, level of over-extraction and mismanagement, I think, of what essentially is a national asset fought over between states, fought over between states. Added to those pressures is now the pressure of climate change and a drying trend that we see you would see, Deputy Speaker, <coughs> certainly in Western Australia, particularly the wheat belt of Western Australia, but we also see in the southeast of our continent as well. And I just want to remind uh, members of some of the work that the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO has done around rainfall and stream flow rates in the southeast, including in the Murray-Darling Basin area. Uh, the Bureau and CSIRO publish, I think, an incredibly important user-friendly report every two years called the State of the Climate Report. And in the 2016 State of the Climate Report, there was a particular focus on rainfall and stream flow rates in those key growing regions of, of Western Australia or the southwest of the continent and the southeast of the continent, particularly in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And I just want to remind members uh, a bit about what the CSIRO and the Bureau said is happening in those regions to add additional pressure to the pressures that have been on this system, on the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, already for many years because of over-extraction. Uh, in their report of 2016, the Bureau and the CSIRO said, and I quote, there has been significant drying across southern Australia, especially across the cool April to October growing season, which is a particular pressure on, um, on our farming communities. 
The report said the recent drying across southern Australia is the strongest recorded large-scale change in rainfall since national records began in 1900. This decrease at an agriculturally and hydrologically important time of the year, the peak growing season, Deputy Speaker, is associated with a trend towards higher mean sea level pressure in the region. A known response to global warming is an increase in mean sea level pressure across southern Australian latitudes. And this means that years with lower than average growing season rainfall are expected to be more frequent than in the past. South East Australia, which obviously takes in much of the basin, has had below average rainfall in 16 of the last 20 April to October periods since 1997. Perhaps more important than rainfall data, though, as the minister would um, appreciate very well, uh, for irrigator communities is the stream flow, the, the, the amount of the rainfall water that actually reaches the, the river system. Uh, and the Bureau and the CSIRO particularly focused on stream flow rates, which uh, are, are dramatically down in the southwest uh, of the continent. In, in your state, Deputy Speaker, I won't go into that because it's not covered by the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, but also down very dramatically in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. The report says that the reduction in rainfall across southern Australia is amplified in stream flow. Obviously, um, rainfall needs to be sufficient to saturate the ground before rain then flows into the river systems and is available to irrigated communities. Since the mid-1990s, uh, the agencies say, stream flow in the southeast is around half the long-term average. During the same period, since the mid-1990s, obviously, stream flow in the Murray-Darling Basin was 41 per cent lower than average. And in some basins in the west and central regions of Victoria, such as the Campaspe Basin, stream flows have declined by more than 70 per cent. If we were not able to start to get the controls on extraction in the, plan that you see, in the basin that you see in the plan, these pressures would arguably place communities across the river system and the environmental health of the river itself uh, in, in perilously, perilously dangerous condition. Now, um, South Australia, we are, I am a representative of South Australia in this debate. South Australia has been making demands since the 1890s for this basin to be managed uh, better and better. Uh, and um, uh, at the Constitutional Convention, as followers of these debates would know, Charles Cameron Kingston, who was perhaps the leading constitutional delegate convention delegate from South Australia, argued that because the basin crossed then colony and soon to be state lines, it should be managed by a national government. It was then an incredibly important national asset Keep going. Okay. And then an incredibly important national asset as it continued to be right through the 20th century. Now South Australia, as so often happens to be the case, got done over by the big states yet again. Uh, and the upstream states, New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland particularly, were able to continue to extract water from the system as much as they wanted. It wasn't until the Federation drought over the course of the turn of the 19th into the 20th century that pressure really built for the upstream states to come to the table and start to talk about a better management system for this critical water source. Uh, and that happened in 1902 only a year after the creation of the Commonwealth and, and really at the point where the Federation drought began to break. Uh, my great-grandfather was a signatory to the, the River Murray Water Agreement of 1914, which resulted from that coming together. It took 12 years to get an agreement. It took us a fair bit of time as well to get the Basin Plan agreed by the member for Watson and different states. Um, it's always been thus. It took 12 years to get the River Murray Water Agreement of 19. 14 signed, which my great grandfather signed on behalf of South Australia, it resulted in significant infrastructure being built, locks and weirs in the river system, uh, and secured minimum monthly flows to South Australia from upstream states. But really, there wasn't much progress from then. For the following 100 years, there was not much progress whatsoever in a system that would better manage this critically important economic and environmental asset. Uh, since that time, it was essentially a matter of ongoing dispute between the different states, particularly with South Australia as the downstream state, um, feeling that it was in a fight against Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. Water reform did progress under Prime Ministers Keating and Howard. I think internationally um, our water market arrangements uh, are um, seen as some of the best 
some of the, the, the really exemplary water market arrangements anywhere in the world. Uh, but we weren't able to translate that foundation of a water market into a better management system for the plant for the basin until the member for Watson was able to finalise the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in 2012. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan, at its heart, seeks to return the system to environmental health, because everything hangs on environmental health. Industry, the health of the communities across the river system. Uh, nothing will work if the river is not returned to environmental health. And that is why we have argued against the, I think, inexplicable decision by Prime Minister Turnbull to give responsibility for the implementation plan to the Agriculture Ministry. This was not something that Prime Minister Howard understood was not the right approach. Prime Minister Abbott understood was not the right approach, for some inexplicable reason, only able to be explained on base politics. Prime Minister Turnbull decided to give the then minister, the Minister for New England, responsibility for implementing a plan he had railed against. He had railed against year in and year out. Um, so we do say that this should be a plan managed by the Environmental Department and the Environment Portfolio because industry, communities and the environmental health of the system depend upon returning this system to a, to a level of sustainable and healthy environment. Now, the core element was, um, was returning 3,200 gigalitres or 3,200 billion litres of water to the system. The core element, at its core, that was the, the central um, position of the plan. Now, for some, uh, for example, the Greens Party, the perfect was the enemy of the good. They thought it should be more than 3,200. So, often true to form in these policy areas, they voted against the plan. And I understand that they've been railing against it still in the Senate, in the other place, over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, members of the National Party, including the current Deputy Prime Minister, voted against the plan as well. On the fringes, the far right and the far left, there was opposition, but fortunately for the system and for the nation, there, was enough, there were enough sensible heads at the centre on both sides of politics to recognise this was our only chance of returning the system to a sustainable and healthy condition. Now, within those 3,200 billion litres was a core condition, particularly for South Australia, and that was the additional 450 gigalitres. The member for New England had made his position clear before becoming the minister with the responsibility for this plan and since that he did not regard that as a favourable term. He made it clear that he had no real intention of implementing that critically important part of the plan. And that has been a central element in the undermining of confidence in this plan. And I, I want to say that that is probably the key reason why the plan has been put back on track by the minister and by the shadow minister, the member for Watson, over recent weeks. The government wasn't really committed to the plan, as evidenced by the position the member for New England had had for many years about the 450 gigalitres of so-called upwater. Compliance was not being taken seriously, as seen most obviously in New South Wales, and there simply wasn't enough scrutiny on the so-called SDL adjustment projects or the Sustainable Diversion Limit adjustment projects, the 605 gigalitres of downwater. There wasn't enough scrutiny for people to have confidence. And all of those elements, all of those concerns have been dealt with by this agreement between the minister and the shadow minister. There's a good package of measures which I think gives a much clearer commitment to that additional 450 gigalitres, linking payments for those states that have SDL adjustment projects, links payments for those projects to their cooperation with the 450 gigalitre process of so-called upwater. There's be better compliance in this package, particularly in the Northern Basin. There's better scrutiny of the SDL adjustment process uh, projects, including through technical workshops that the authority will run with groups like the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. And as the member for Bendigo said, who spoke before me, there's much better support for cultural water outcomes for Indigenous Australians in the basin area. I want to reiterate, um, Deputy Speaker, this plan, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, is far and away our best chance of returning the river to a healthy, sustainable condition and we cannot let that chance slip away. I thank the member. The question is